thank you for very very kind introduction and uh, i i think yes i i also now found that the clinical rounds in endocrinology the book which has been written by us way back in 2015 16 i think that has really made wonders that is i think globally acknowledged now and um, people are happy right. with that i think we will come with the new editions in future yes sir we eagerly are waiting for that sir yeah thank you so uh, i will start my talk that is on prolactinoma and pregnancy and uh, i think we have already listened to jj and he has given very thoughtfully the pituitary incident lomas and uh, that's i think one of the major challenging task in clinical practice similarly you have got a another challenging area where you find patient is having a prolactinoma in pregnancy and particularly with the macrodinomas the decisions are very important and secondly the breastfeeding and lactations what you should do so i think these queries i will try to answer so this is the context i think we'll go ahead with this so we will discuss two cases one the case security one a 30 year old lady presented with amenorrhea and galactorrhea she had a prolactin of 337 her mri cella was 13 mm pituitary adenoma with supracellular extension she was treated with cabergoline and she resumed cycles and missed period for two weeks then she is a upt was found to be positive so what you should do you should do switch to cabergoline to bromocyptin one you continue cabergoline you discontinue cabergoline or you recommend electrotermination of pregnancy so we'll try to answer what is the most suitable answer in this scenario as i mentioned that she had a macrodinoma the tumor size was 13 mm and with a supracellular extension but without any visual field defects the another case vignette is where a lady presented with a severe headache at 37th week of pregnancy and she had already had a 14 mm prolactinoma with supracellular extension and visual field defects she had a high serum prolactin treated with cabergoline tumor decreased to size to 5 mm and mainly became intracellular she is off cabergoline since conception her visual fields are consistently normal so what you should do restart cabergoline plan for tss recommend mri cella or major serum prolactin so these are the issues which we are going to discuss with you so let us see that how common is prolactinoma and how commonly the patients with prolactinoma has become pregnant it's a very rare tumor uh, roughly around 4 in 10000 but the most common functional pituitary tumor the majority of women with prolactinoma regardless of size whether it is a micro or macro are diagnosed prior to conception and rarely 1% of the women may be diagnosed to have prolactinoma during pregnancy for the first time either manifesting as the apoplexy or the mass effects of the tumor what happens to what is the characteristics of the lactotroph cells why we are have so much of concern because they are laterally placed they contribute around 30% of the pituitary mass and they are very precariously supplied because they are laterally placed that's why they are very prone for any ischemic injury or ischemic damage and in during a pregnancy you have the estradiol mediated lactotroph cell hyperplasia that's why the pituitary mass is further increased by 30% so the overall mass of the lactotroph during pregnancy is almost 50% plus there is a small amount of a prolactin comes from the placenta that is a decidual prolactin which is not regulated by dopamine so the important point is that there is a estradiol mediated lactotroph cell hyperplasia during pregnancy so the pregnancy so the pituitary volume is almost 50% is contributed by your lactotrophs if you look for a serum prolactin in pregnancy people ask many times how much prolactin can rise during the pregnancy so you see that the hair is at as the duration of pregnancy increases there is a consistent rise in a serum prolactin and the two line indicates the it's a zone it's a range of values so even at 30 weeks to between 40 weeks the prolactin can reach up to 500 to 600 nanogram per ml so it may remain something around 50 to 500 nanogram per ml so finding a prolactin of 500 or even a 600 at the end of pregnancy is not surprising if you go further what happens to anatomical changes in pituitary there is a progressive rise in uh, pituitary volume and this is a data done in a 23 year old woman uh, who normal woman and there is a progressive increase in pituitary volume during pregnancy what happens to say mri in pregnancy there is asymmetrical enlargement and deviation of the stalk it's a different from the physiological enlargement of the pituitary gland because pituitary gland is the stalk is usually not deviated the pituitary height is usually around 10 mm normally it is around 8 to 9 mm 
Now the next question comes: If someone is harboring a tumor, does the tumor grow during pregnancy? Yes, they do grow. It's a both macro as well as micro, both do grow. And the reason for the growth of a tumor during pregnancy is the tumor tissue also express E2 receptors. So again, it is a estradiol mediated uh, tumor hyperplasia or tumor growth. And secondly, many times you withdraw the D2 agonist prior soon after conception. That can be another contributory factor for the increase in size of the tumor during pregnancy. If you see this data, the person with uh, in microadenoma, person patients with symptomatic enlargement is only 2.6. Macroadenoma is around 31%. They do experience symptomatic enlargement, while macroadenoma, if they have been received prior surgery or radiation, it's only 5%. Similarly, those who have received even a kebergulli prior, only 4 to 5%, they do have a symptomatic enlargement during pregnancy. So very important point is that even someone has got a macroadenoma, if they received treatment prior to that, prior to conception, then the probability of an increase in the size of the tumor is very low. So this is the, you can see that this is the MRA pictures, the pre-pregnancy and the post-pregnancy at seven months gestation, the tumor size increases in pregnancy. However, still it is not abutting the optic chiasm. If you talk about the tumor enlargement in pregnancy, this is the data by the Mollish et al. So those macro and micro uh, those are macrodenomas without treatment and with treatment. And you can see that again, the last line, uh, only 22% those who did not have enlargement, uh, those who did not have any treatment, while those who were treatment, only 4% or 5% had enlargement of the tumor. So prior treatment is one of the major determinant of the increase in size during pregnancy. So how prolactinomas influence the pregnancy? Yes, in pregnancy, the prolactinomas are basically are vulnerable for uh, apoplexy and eventually hypopetrotism. And you are also concerned about the side effects of D2 agonist on fetus if they are continued throughout the pregnancy. So it's a very important, but that's why the, some people have used, even a Mollish have used this word, the treatment of prolactinoma is pregnancy. Because of the, as I mentioned, they are laterally placed, they are precariously supplied, and if there's a further enlargement, then the tumor may undergo necrosis. So that's why we say that the prolactinomas are very, very vulnerable for apoplexy. Then what are the chances of apoplexy? This is our own data of pregnancy and tumor outcomes in infertile women with macroplatinomas on cabergulin therapy. So two of our patients, we had a 48 pregnancies in 33 women and the two of our patients had apoplexy in second trimester and both were on cabergulin. So this was the how the apoplexy looks like. So this patient came presented with a severe headache and you can see that patient had apoplexy. However, the patient was the same even prior cabergulin therapy. So if you talk about the effect of D2 agonist on fetus, uh, if you see between with malformations with bromocyptin 1.8, with cabergulin 3.8, with a normal 3. So statistically, there is no significant difference between the two, whether the patient has received uh, D2 agonist or not. Certainly, the chances are less with bromo as opposed to cabergulin. That's why the guideline also incorporates that if you find out a pregnancy and a patient is having a macrodenoma and it is abutting the optic chiasm, the best is you shift switch to from cabergulin to bromocyptin in first trimester. The clinical dilemma, what should be done if pregnant woman comes in a late first or early second trimester and found to be on bromocyptin and cabergulin. So even if someone is having a macrodenoma, have received cabergulin earlier, it does not justify any for her therapeutic abortions. So this is another data from us, macrodenoma and pregnancy outcomes. So this shows that the 48 pregnancies, the four had missed abortions, three had congenital malformations, and 42 progressed still term, and the two had a still birth. Is cabergulin teratogenic? We didn't find in our data. And amongst the 42 live births, the low birth weight was in three, and seven years followed, these children is reassuring. So if someone continues cabergulin even during pregnancy, and even continues during later, if there's a no um, ill effects, neither on mother nor on children. Then prior to pregnancy, I think the, this I just wanted to mention that you can take even decisions soon after the UPT is found to be positive. So patients on D2 agonist therapy, sometimes even before resuming the cycles, they do conceive. So they use the barrier contraception till normalization of serum prolactin. Significant reduction in tumor volume already has happened. Intracellular or 5 millimeter away from the chiasm, you are not much worried. And reduce the chance of clinically important enlargement during pregnancy. 
as far as microplatinumine pregnancy is concerned, as soon as the UPT is positive, stop dopamine agonist. The low risk of clinically relevant tumor expansion, as I mentioned, and follow monthly for new onset headache and visual disturbances, visual field examinations. No need for periodical imaging and no need for measuring serum prolactin. Many patients are unnecessarily getting a serum prolactin and MRI done with microplatinomas. It is not required. You are pretty sure about it, the probability of increasing or expanding the microplatinomas into the macro into the macro or an enlargement in size is only 2.8%. So don't require, in fact. As far as the macro is concerned, I think again you should be very confident that you can stop the drug even with the, if even the larger tumor has become intracellular or if it is 5 mm away from the optic chiasma. If the, even the tumor might be having a supracellular extension, but it is not abutting the chiasma or away from the 5 mm away from the chiasma, you can confidently, and particularly when the patient has already been prior, treated prior with kibargolin. So that's a very important, and even in macrodinoma, now with a greater understanding of availability of imaging, we are pretty sure about that, that even you can discontinue even in macrodinoma. So what about the monitoring? If symptomatic tumor enlargement occurs during pregnancy, you monitor visual fields, you can have a known contrast cellular MRI and monitoring of prolactin is again not useful. So only clinical parameters like headache, new onset headache, new onset visual field defects, or uh, these are the clues rather than prolactin. Then you can reinstitute. It is less harmful to the mother and child in surgery. And... Uh, Important point here is that even in pregnancy, you if someone has got a new onset headache or visual field defects, don't even ask for a surgical intervention because the effect of cabergolin occurs within hours. So there's a tremendous improvement even in a visual field defects in around four to eight hours, even you institute once the dopamine agonist. So surgical intervention is only to be resorted if there's either apoplexy or there's a new onset neurological deficits. Then and then you should go for the surgery. What about breastfeeding? Breastfeeding should also be encouraged. Stop dopamine agonists, particularly cabergolin, two weeks prior to delivery to facilitate breastfeeding. No evidence regarding increased tumor size during lactation. Remember that the rise in a prolactin, even with each suckling, is very transient. So there's a no risk in increase in the tumor size during uh, lactation. An exception is a lady with already someone is having a visual field impairment and tumor is there, then it may be otherwise breastfeeding, it should be increased. In a postpartum period, prolactin levels and MRI not indicated while lactating. Serum prolactin and pituitary imaging should be done after two months of discontinuation of lactation. So hyperprolactinemia after pregnancy, yes, in patients with a tumor, you can see that. So there is the recurrence of hyperlactinemia, like in our study, was observed in 56% of women. So the prolactin recurs high in those with both macro as well as the microprotectinomans. So it is a treatment in half of the patients, in fact. And this is our data that how the tumor outcome, the tumor size decrease in 63% of the patients, it remains same or increase or disappear. Even the tumor disappeared in 24% of patients. So that's why the pregnancy is the treatment of prolactinoma because you are taking the advantage of the vulnerability of the ischemic injury to the electrotrophs during pregnancy. So to conclude, the tumor enlargement is rare in microadenomas and unusual in treated microadenomas. So it's a 3% and 5%. So we are pretty sure about that. And you can barely stop the cabergolin even during pregnancy, even in macroadenomas. The dopamine agonists are not necessary to be continued in majority of cases of macroadenomas. The careful monitoring of a new onset headache and visual field defects is required. Yes, unless the patient is difficult to follow up or difficult to reach to you, then I think issues are there. Otherwise, if there's a headache and new onset headache and visual field defects are there, then certainly you require a non-contrast MRI and you require a reinstitution of a drug. And even the surgical intervention can be avoided for a, uh, for because the drug is effective within hours. And there are no significant teratogenic effects of dopamine agonist. And as I showed, the data is almost comparable, 3% with gabargulin and 3.5% with gabargulin and 3% in a normal population. So I think with these, I conclude my talk and I would like to say that it's a challenge, but I think the most of the things are now crystal clear and in a real world setting, how we should really manage the patients. I think these guidelines now are making it a very clear uh, day by day. Thank you.